Welcome back after the break. Uh, just before we went for the break, we began uh, looking at uh, studying chapter uh, 2 of First Timothy. Uh, we looked at verse 7 where Paul says he's appointed as a preacher and an apostle and also a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and uh, trust. Okay, we'll move on to verses 8 to 10. Um, can somebody read verses 8 to 10, please? Can somebody please read verses 8 to 10? Verses 8 uh, to 10. I desire, therefore, that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with uh, propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but with proper for women professing godliness with good works. Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. So in the light that all that Paul has been talking about prayer, he is coming back to the main point and he's saying, you know, he desires that men pray everywhere. And here the Greek word he uses is not anthropos, which is people, but he uses the Greek word anna, which is referring specifically to the male gender. And he's saying he wants men every, to pray everywhere. And how should men pray everywhere? What does he say? Lifting up of hands. Okay, what does lifting up of holy hands mean? When you lift up your hands, what are you basically doing? See? We're trying to reach out to God. When we lift our hands, what do we, what are we what is what are we showing? What does it show? What is what is the sign? Surrender, right? You know, you're surrendering uh, yourself uh, to God. Um, what is holy hands? What is the lifting up of holy hands means you're surrendering is lifting up. What is holy hands? You're basically doing this in holiness and reverence. Uh, no argument or doubting. Okay. Uh, Sorry, no argument. And also it says, you know, without wrath uh, and doubting. So what is wrath? Not in anger. Okay, and doubting is without anger, without quarreling and no strife. Okay, so he's saying men everywhere, I want you to pray, uh, surrendering yourself to God uh, in holiness you know, without any argument or doubting, which means without anger or without quarreling or uh, strife, okay? Uh, so he's saying in the like manner, women should also pray, okay? There's no excuse that only men, uh, you know, must uh, lift up holy hands and pray um, without wrath and doubting, but he's, uh, or without quarreling, he's saying that even women need to do the same. Okay, and then he says that you know uh, he talks about women ad uh, adorning themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly uh, clothing. Okay, which is uh, proper for women professing godliness with good works. So is Paul here saying that women should not, um, uh, you know? dress with braided hair, you know, not wear any gold or pearls or not wear any costly clothing. What do you think? What is, so can we take this and say that in, today in our churches, women should not do all of these things? What is your viewpoint? What is Paul basically saying here? Any uh, thoughts on this? 
this is quite a you know a concern because many of them use this verse in our modern day churches as well and say you know women should not braid their hair should not wear gold uh, you know uh, pearls costly clothing so please share your thoughts on this i'll just share my thoughts uh, i strongly believe it's not about not to wear jewels or something might be some cultural background which i i may think of but i think it's more about uh, what your what your motives are if you want to show the godliness you want to show the good works uh, i think that that may still apply now like sunday church is not about dressing up and going it's about uh, uh, just coming together as a as a fellowship and being there for each other and uh, coming together and worshiping god it's not about what dress you wear on on sundays maybe that could be a point we could uh, take out of it but i don't think it really talks about braiding the hair or things this is just my point of view okay thank you jeffina anyone else So Paul is basically saying here that women need to dress modestly and engage in good works so that you know they demonstrate uh, godliness. And he's saying, uh, you know, how uh, people who believe or profess their faith in Jesus Christ need to dress up is with uh, and uh, you know. Uh, so the word modest apparel. Actually, these words propriety and moderation help to understand or explain what he meant by, you know, modest apparel. Modest apparel means to dress in propriety and moderation. So what is propriety? It basically asks this question, is, you know, is it appropriate for the occasion? The way I'm dressing, is it appropriate for the occasion? Am I overdressed or I'm underdressed? You know, it's important to ask these questions. Uh, is it going to call for inappropriate attention to myself? Uh, is my dressing going to be provocative? So when I go to church, am I dressing up to provocate men? You know, um, am I dressing up just to, you know, uh, honor the Lord? The way I dress is what I'm wearing appropriate to where I'm going. Sometimes if we look at people, even when they come to church and the way they dress, we feel that it's so inappropriate for the place that they are in, you know, the place they are. So some of them dress like they've come to, uh, you know, uh, out they're going to the beach or they've come to the beach or, you know, they come in shorts and t-shirts and, you know, uh, footwear. I mean, uh, it's okay, but you know, <laughs> it's not okay. But for me, it's not okay for them, it's okay. You know, but I feel like, hey, it it's so casual in the in the in the way they have come to uh, church. I mean, I'm sure they won't dress like this when they go to uh, their workplace, and you know that's why now they're coming up with dress codes even in colleges and in workplaces, um, in schools as well, making it more strict. Uh, so, propriety basically asks the question: Is it appropriate for the occasion? Is it overdressed or underdressed? You know, or I'm calling uh, 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 inappropriate attention to myself. It's very, very important, and I think it's so important these days the way people coming dressed to church. Sometimes, you know, uh, am I dressing up in a way that is inappropriate? Is calling attention to people. Another word that he uses here to explain, help explain modest apparel is moderation. So when you're thinking about moderation, you know, uh, moderation asks. Is it moderate? Is it just too much or far too little? Okay, so moderation is basically middle ground, being balanced in the way you uh, dress. And he talks about braided hair uh, or gold or pearls or costly clothing, you know. Um, and Paul mentions that too much of these actually is going against the principles of propriety and moderation in that culture because I think it, it had to do so much with the culture that they were living in in the city of uh, uh, Ephesus you know we talked about in the in the introduction the background to the study of uh, Ephesus you know the main goddess that was worshipped there was the goddess Dinah right and because she was a goddess she, 
they were women priests and you know the way they used to dress up uh, it had a huge cultic uh, sexual cultic uh, perversion to this whole thing and uh, a, a cultic uh, uh, se sexual cultic uh, undertone to this whole thing so the way they dress and everything was so uh, you know inappropriate was so um, uh, you know uh, calling attention to themselves because they were seeking attention to themselves as women priests and it was so inappropriate so when they became believers and coming to the church you know they would be dressing the same way and so that's why i think paul is addressing this uh, matter and this issue so paul is saying that women you know when you get together pray and your uh, your prayer should be focused not on the way you adorn yourself, your way you dress, but on godliness and uh, good works. Okay, and um, so when we are trying to understand this passage or we're trying to interpret it, we always need to interpret it in the light of the rest of scripture. So in the rest of scripture, is it uh, mentioned anywhere that women should not wear uh, jewelry? Okay, do the rest of scripture strictly prohibits prohibits men, women from wearing uh, gold jewelry, braiding their hair, wearing costly clothing. What is the answer? Does the rest of scripture mention this? No, it does not mention. Okay, uh, you know, but it tells us to consider the example of Abraham's wife, Sarah. Look at what First Peter chapter 3 verses 1 to 6 says. Um, you know, in uh, First Peter chapter 3 verses 1 to 6, Paul, Peter, Peter is writing and saying, you know, uh, you know, wives to submit to their husbands. Um, and he says, you know, uh, live pure, uh, uh, reverent lives. And in verse 3, he says, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, uh, such as elaborate hairstyles and wearing of gold and jewelry or fine clothes. He says, not, he does not mention you should not wear. He said, it should not come from outward ado adornment, such as elaborate you know, of all of these things, what he mentions, but of the inner self and unfading beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit, which is great worth in God's sight. And then he talks about, uh, you know, be submissive to your own husbands like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. Okay, so he says, you are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear. So, you know, here it talks about uh, following the example of Abraham's wife, Sarah, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Sarah. We also knew in 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 her, in that that time uh, would have worn ornaments and jewelry because if you look at Genesis chapter twenty four verses twenty two and was and uh, was fifty three, we see that you know uh, when Abraham sends his servant to choose his wife for his son Isaac, you know, uh, and the servant goes is waiting on God. And when the camels had finished drinking, you know, the, the girl who uh, draws out water and feeds all the camels, he knows that this is the one, who, you know, he's going to take back as a, as a bride for Isaac. Uh, he took out gold, uh, a gold nose ring weighing a becker and two gold bracelets weighing 10 shekels and gives it to her. So we know that, you know, in, in, in that culture, they wore a lot of uh, gold and jewelry and, uh, you know, so uh, Sarah would have also uh, worn a lot of ornaments. So when he's saying follow the example of Sarah, he's saying follow the example of her, you know, uh, being obedient and being submissive to her husband. It's not saying, you know, you shouldn't be wearing uh, uh, gold ornaments and uh, costly clothing. So when we uh, interpret scriptures like this we need to interpret it in the light of the rest of scripture and so the rest of scripture does not say anywhere that you know women should not wear gold or silver or pearls or costly um, clothing okay verses 11 to uh, uh, 15 can somebody read that please verses 11 to 15 Anyone can read verses 11 to 15, please. Let, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith 
love and holiness with self-control. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Roslyn. So here Paul is talking again about women and he's addressing another issue. And here he's saying, let a woman learn in silence with all submission. And what else does he say? What does he not permit women to do? What does he not permit women to do? Not to teach. And? To have authority over a man. Okay, they're not supposed to have authority over a man, uh, but they are silent. supposed to be silent. Yes. Thank you, Rosalind and Jafina. So, what do you think? Women should not be allowed to teach. That means I should not be here teaching. <laughs> yeah. Uh, should not have authority of man. Should be silent. Yes, Rosalind? I guess uh, it probably means that uh, women should not be bossy over men. Okay, women should not be bossy over men. Okay. What else? But here he's saying, let a woman learn in silence. And he's saying, I do not permit a woman to teach, but to be silent. So many of them have taken this and have said, you know, when Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach, women cannot teach. So what are your thoughts on this? I think uh, thinking from the cultural perspective, like you said, uh, there were women priests, uh, maybe that could be one of the reasons for them to first learn. Uh, because they would have come to such a culture where they were worshipping Diana, preaching about Diana, maybe, and might uh, create a conflict. Um, I just think like that because you said women priests were there. So for them first to learn in silence and then maybe when they are uh, really matured in their faith, matured in the uh, understanding of the truth, maybe they can start preaching. I think that could be it. Like, Yes, that's a good thought. Thank you, Jeffina. Anyone else? So here, if we uh, look at these passages, we need to always interpret it in the rest of, or in the light of the rest of scripture, right? Uh, we need to look and see if this is what Paul is saying uh, elsewhere, you know? Or is this, this, this the only place? And if this is the only place, why is he mentioning it here? Okay, so that is something, you know, that we need to see. Did Paul practice, when, if Paul is saying, I do not permit a woman uh, to preach and teach, did Paul practice it himself? Okay, that's another thing that we need to uh, see. Okay, and also we need to look at the context, why he's writing this and uh, what is the importance of him saying this, uh, you know, uh, is it relevant? Why is he saying this uh, in this? And so what is the important context? But if you look here, you know, um, I see the context that he's talking about is basically two things, submission and authority over man. Okay. These are two things that stand out for me, submission and authority. In this context, he's talking about women should learn in silence, women should not, are not permitted to teach, they should be quiet in the context of submission and authority over men. So, you know, we will look at, um, you know, um, uh, this in the context of the rest of scripture and Paul's own ministry ex, uh, practices and the context why Paul is uh, writing this uh, what uh, uh, here to uh, Timothy. Okay, um, and we are going to look at it because you know people have used the scripture passage uh, to prevent men, uh, women from preaching and teaching. So let's look at Paul's own ministry practice. Did he have women in his ministry team? Did Paul have women in his ministry team? Yes, no. Can you remember some names of women? Okay, Priscilla's there, Aquila, Phil, Priscilla, husband and wife team. There was Phoebe. Okay, so we see that Aquila and Priscilla, they were uh, husband and wife, a couple, a part of the ministry team. And Paul recognizes them. We read about this in uh, Romans chapter 16, verses 3 and 4. 
Paul also mentions or recognizes Phoebe as a women leader and as a deacon. Uh, we uh, learned about this in Romans chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Also in Romans chapter 16, um, the same chapter in verse 7, he talks about Junia, okay, a woman leader, and he's, he mentions her as a fellow prisoner uh, and also someone respected by the apostles and also by, you know, possibly by Apostle uh, Paul himself, okay? And, um, and so she was basically also an apostle her, um, herself, okay? Uh, we also see that uh, when, you know, uh, uh, Paul mentions about membership gifts in Romans chapter 12, when he talks about the gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and, uh, you know, when he's encouraging uh, that all, you know, to prophesy and teach in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. And when he talks about the ministry gifts in uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, you know, he does not specifically, you know, there um, talk about it in, uh, you know, that it's uh, uh, only related to a specific gender. Uh, he just talks about the membership gifts, the gifts of the Spirit, and also, you know, the ministry gives in a general context, which means that it can be distributed across all believers and there's no gender, gender specific, specificity given in any of these um, verses, okay? None of these verses uh, mention any specific uh, gender. So we knew and we know that even women you know, um, received membership gifts. They were, um, uh, the church at Corinth, men and women were very eager to, you know, uh, when they come to church to uh, share what God has, uh, you know, given to them, whether it's a word of wisdom, knowledge, or prophecy. But he just talks about how to do it in a very cordial manner, in a very, um, uh, in orderly manner, so that it's not disrupting the whole service. Okay. So in all of these areas, uh, you know, it's not talking about any specific gender, but we know that's given to all men and uh, women. And we also see that in Paul's ministry, he had many women and he mentions about them and he acknowledges the work that uh, they do. Also, we see that, uh, you know, we can look at the context in which Paul is writing this epistle to Timothy. Now, the context here is that, you know, um, uh, again, had to do around this cult group, uh, the goddess uh, Diana. And, and I, like I said, she had many, uh, the priests who were serving her were basically um, women. And, uh, you know, um, uh, these female priestess of uh, Diana, you know, they just invaded the first century church. And uh, these priests, uh, this priest, basically promoted blasphemous ideas about sex and spirituality. And, you know, they themselves uh, performed rituals which they pronounced curses uh, on men and women. Basically, they did this to, you know, um, to declare their superiority over men. Okay, and I think they enjoy the superiority over uh, men compared to the cultures around them because of uh, the goddess Dinah. And when they kind of became believers and they came into the church, you know, uh, some of them were influenced by these priestess and their lifestyle and their way of living. And they would have done the same in the church where they were they wanting to take over authority and they were not submitting to men. They might have been very loud in the way they were asking questions or talking or discussing in the church. And so, you know, um, the issue here was their submission, their yielding to men, to those who are in leadership, those who were uh, uh, in places of uh, uh, positions of authority. And so Paul is reminding them that, hey, you know, um, I want all women to, you know, stay silent, to learn in silence. 
and not to have authority over men and you know to submit to godly leadership to submit to the men whom god has placed in authority in lead and in leadership yes in the the temple in the culture that exists in ephesus the there's a goddess who is uh, uh, the god that is worshiped you know the goddess that is worshiped and they yes there are female priests but here in the church this is the order we follow where you know men are in authority in leadership and it is uh, mandatory or required of women to submit uh, to uh, the men in leadership and in authority and women should uh, you know uh, uh, be silent and he says i do not permit a woman to teach maybe because like uh, like again jafina said they had to come to a place where they were still learning you know learning the truths the doctrines and hence he did not permit a woman to teach and to speak but um we see that in the the church at corinth you know women uh, were flowing in all the gifts of the spirit they would also prophesy they would also preach and teach but we don't see anywhere there uh, paul basically mentioning that hey women you need to be silent you can't exercise uh, the gifts of the spirit but basically he was what he was saying there in uh, church uh, to the church at corinth is do things in an orderly way wait for other people to finish speaking uh, to say things and then you know you take your turn so do things in a very orderly uh, way okay so um, paul is reminding them that in the governmental structure of the church the authority structure that god has placed in the church if you remember we learned uh, in this in his learn in the second year during the kingdom builders course uh, and the kingdom of god that you know god has placed authority structures uh, governmental authority structures in our life in various areas in the home in the church in our workplace um, uh, in our society uh, there are authority structures that he's placed and we need to respect those authority structures and we need to submit to those authority structures so just like the authority structure in the home the man is the head so also in the church the pastor the priest is the head so he's Paul is reminding them of man's headship in God's government in the church that uh, uh, that are men and he's saying hey women i want you to submit to them and then he says for adam was formed first then eve so why is uh, paul mentioning about adam and eve here any idea why is paul talking about adam and eve here Any thoughts? So basically, to explain to them that you know, uh, 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 or remind them of God's uh, authority structure that He's placed, uh, He's saying that uh, you know, man, uh, uh, that man is the head in God's government and so he's mentioning about adam and eve and he's saying adam was created first was formed first and then eve was uh, formed okay um so paul was uh, basically uh, not prohibiting women from being in a ministry or serving god or preaching or teaching but he's here talking about active submission of uh, women to men which was the right proper code of conduct in the local church um, and in the cultural context of the church compared to the cultural context in the uh, city of Ephesus. Okay, so that is the second point that we looked at uh, the cultural context that he was writing this in. The, uh, the third one is let us look at, uh, you know, if women are not allowed to teach, is this mentioned in the rest of uh, scripture? Okay, is it mentioned throughout scripture that women should not preach or teach? Sorry. Yeah, that is in the context in Corinth, the church at Corinth is talking about how to, you know, exercise the gifts of the spirit in a very orderly way. Because everyone was so eager to come to church and just, you know, <laughs> so-called rattle off their the what they have received. But Paul is saying, hey, do it in an orderly way. Okay. 
So we see that both in the Old and New Testament that, you know, women were anointed by the Holy Spirit. Yes, Abu Bekah? Yes, go ahead, Abu Bekah, you have raised your hand. Sorry, it's my hand just just lost intentionally. Okay. Okay, no worries. So we see that both in the Old and New Testament, women were anointed by the Holy Spirit and used by God. And, uh, you know, like Miriam, Deborah, Esther, Ruth, and other prophetess, Philip's daughters who were also prophesying, you know, uh, all of them prophesying, preaching, and teaching as well. Okay. So that leads us to verse 14. Before that, anyone has anything to say? Anything you disagree? Anything in the light of what we have been talking so far? Any questions? Before we go on to verse 14. No, Pastor. Okay. Uh, verse 14, Paul writes, And Adam was not deceived, but woman being deceived fell into transgression. So why do you think Paul is writing about this here in verse 14? It seems rather irrelevant here, but why is he writing it? Is he saying that women are easily deceived and hence they should not teach and preach because they will be teaching all their deceptions? <laughs> what do you think? I think maybe it again talks about some mission. Uh, I, I just think like, you know, not sure. wonder how the story would have gone if Adam took the fruit. <laughs> I just wonder. Okay. Anyone else? I think he's just reminding the women about Eve, like what happened with Eve, so that they, the women in that church can be cautious and um, be alert. Okay, thank you, Rosalind. So here he's saying that, you know, uh, Adam was not deceived, but women being deceived fell into transgression. It doesn't mean that men will not be deceived. This verse does not imply that, you know, women are easily more deceived than men are. What Apostle Paul is simply saying here is, you know, he's just stating what happened in Genesis, okay, uh, in the garden, Genesis chapter 3, when the serpent or Satan directly spoke to Eve and lied to her and easily deceived her, you know, and got her to, you know, be deceived so easily that she took the first bite and he did not have to deceive, there was no need for him to deceive Adam because you know, Eve passed the fruit to Adam and he ate it without questioning, okay? And both disobeyed God and both equally sinned before God and both fell, okay? So he's, he's, not, he's not mentioning here that, you know, women are more easily deceived in the context that, you know, because of their uh, 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 deception, they are not supposed to uh, preach and teach, but he's just mentioning that, uh, that both of them can fall into deception and, you know, but uh, women need to be careful. Uh, women need to learn and uh, uh, just like, you know, uh, Eve fell into deception and, um, you know, and even Adam and they sinned before God. So he might be stating here that, you know, um, be careful, you know, if you don't submit to godly structure, to godly authority, you know, it can lead to uh, deception. It can lead to shipwreck of your uh, faith and a good uh, conscience. Okay. And then he goes to talk about, uh, you know, nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing. They continue in faith, love, holiness uh, with self-control. So why is Paul talking here about uh, childbirth? Any idea? Why is Paul here talking about childbirth? Maybe he's just continuing in the same context of what happened as a result of the fall of uh, 
you know, or the sin of Eve, the curse that she received, that, you know, uh, she will give birth in pain, okay? But, um, you know, um, she would be, you know, kept safe, preserved, uh, because of, you know, the salvation that they receive in Christ Jesus, okay? Uh, they will be saved uh, through the work of salvation. And we know that this word saved, uh, the Greek word is sozo, okay? The Greek word for salvation is um, sozo. Uh, it also means saved. Uh, what does sozo mean? What does sozo mean? Sozo means salvation, it means um, uh, saved, but it also, you know, it's a very comprehensive word. It just does not include, uh, you know, um, being saved from our sins, saved from death and from, uh, uh, from uh, Satan, but also means um, healing from sickness. It means deliverance from every work of the enemy. It means rescue or preservation from a danger and harm basically means total wholeness. So it's a very comprehensive word. So sozo can, you know, mean to be saved, healed, delivered, victorious, rescued, and preserved. It means all of these things at the same time, okay? And uh, this word sozo is a verb. It's an action word. Okay, something that is done, something that happens uh, because of the work of God in our lives, it happens because of the wor work of salvation in our lives. It is, you know, uh, an action word. You know, we are saved, we are healed, we are delivered, we are rescued, we are victorious, we are preserved. And it, uh, it basically means we are saved out from the devil's power and we are restored into the wholeness of uh, God's order and the well-being of or the wholeness of the well-being of God through the power of uh, God's Spirit or by the work of the Holy uh, Spirit, okay? Uh, so why does Apostle Paul talk about women and childbirth at this time? Um, you know, again, we need to look at it in both the biblical context and the historical or the local context. Okay, uh, the biblical context, we, we know that the curse that was given to Eve as a result of eating the fruit from the tree was, you know, that she would um, have pain during uh, childbirth. But here the promise that Paul is giving them is they will be uh, preserved, they will be saved, saved so so because of their salvation, total wholeness, total well-being. Also in the cultural context, um, we see that, you know, um, uh, the goddess Dinah was, uh, you know, some historians say is the goddess of the opposite. Some disagree to this, you know. Uh, they say that she was basically a guardian of uh, young children, uh, you know, or basically supported women during childbirth. Uh, she used to protect women uh, uh, during the time of labor. And also she was, you know, the goddess of the opposites. Uh, the uh, uh, the other side of her was, uh, you know, uh, uh, the they referred to her as Artemis. Um, basically, it was, uh, and some historians don't agree to this, to this, but uh, they say Artemis was a Greek goddess and uh, Diana was uh, the considered the uh, Roman goddess. But you know, some of them say that she was a goddess of the opposites. Anyways, just for us to understand, you know, she used to protect uh, the women in labor, but also like Artemis was some somebody who brought about sudden death while giving birth. So if Artemis was angry with you, would give uh, you know would cause sudden death when you're giving. Um, birth um, and also Artemis was considered as a divinity of healing but also was considered as someone who brought about disease like leprosy, rabies and even gout. Okay, so 
uh, the Apostle Paul is addressing this cultural issue, uh, maybe because women would live in such fear of this goddess Dinah that, you know, if they would not appease her, uh, then, you know, instead of helping and protecting them during childbirth would also cause sudden death while giving um, birth. So this was the kind of the mindset that the, the women had. Um, and also some women would also, you know, consider that a curse that, Eve uh, uh, received, you know, uh, when uh, she sinned. So uh, Paul is reminding them that, hey, you know, um, yes, all this is there, but, you know, uh, you are women as you are, have now uh, believed in Jesus Christ, you are under the spiritual covering, you are saved, you have received salvation, so and so, you are protected, you are rescued, you're victorious, you're delivered from every attack of the uh, evil one, and you're restored to wholeness. So believe that. And he's saying, you know, pray towards this, because he's talking uh, about all of this in the context of prayer. So he's saying, pray towards this. And when you pray, you know, do this in a reverential way, in a way that is pleasing um, uh, to God. And he's saying, you know, uh, if you want to experience this sozo in your life, continue in faith, love, holiness with self-control. Okay. So he's saying, you know, put on these virtues, put on faith, put on love and holiness and self-control so that you can, you know, overcome uh, all of these and you can experience uh, the blessings of so and so, uh, that is your spiritual inheritance, inheritance that you've received um, as you've received salvation. Okay, so that is why he is um, writing this here in this context um, to the women at uh, Ephesus. Any questions? Any questions? Anything you'd like to share? Okay, what really stood out for you all in chapter two? Anyone would like to, two or three can share? What really in, impacted you or stood out? Uh, some new insights that you receive from chapter two. Nobody wants to share, everyone in class? Um, yes. Yeah, so I like the when you said the ministry is not a matter of convenience, it's a command. And I think uh, made me think about myself, how seriously I have to take my works. Uh, when I do something for God, I should be giving all, all of my 100 percentage as much as I can. That's one of the things that really stood out. And I think this chapter answered most of my questions, like uh, about the women especially. And uh, there are uh, even these generation people I've seen uh, a young girl recently uh, and she's a Tamil and she's getting famous just by saying that women should not preach and uh, yeah she and she's like as if she's speaking very theologically she speaks and uh, uh, people are accepting it people are uh, moving towards it and uh, that's what I one of the things that was affecting me recently and, and she quotes the scripture exactly and uh, I don't know if, if this is a question or something, but what she says is that uh, women cannot be pastors, like they can't lead a church, but they can be preachers or evangelists. Uh, so if someone says like that, like, I don't know, like how to answer them, because here it says women should not teach, it doesn't say that what she quotes is, it doesn't say they should not preach. <laughs> So they, they just should not preach, uh, sorry, teach. That's what she says. And uh, people are believing it is in context. But yeah, I think this chapter answered a lot of questions. For me. Yeah. Thank you, Jeffina. Anyone else would like to share?
Okay. Anyone else? Um, I just want you to repeat one thing about uh, the king who was in that time when he said uh, it was hard for the mother to pray for the king. I just missed to take it on my notes. Can you just hear it? Sorry. So she was asking about uh, uh, the king, Nero, and what I had mentioned. So I'm saying it's already there in the notes, and you know, uh, she can just read it from there. Anyone else? Any questions? Okay, we have uh, five more minutes. Should we end class, or can we just begin reading Second Timothy chapter two? John Paul has already left the meeting. <laughs> Okay, uh, we'll stop here. Uh, we'll uh, we'll look. We'll begin chapter three um, next week. Okay, thank you all for joining class and have a blessed, restful weekend. See you all next week. Thank you. So he left the class. <laughs>